And this subject of, of this panel is, is uh, near and dear to my heart. Um, for 20 years, my wife has been telling me that she doesn't understand what I do, and I'm really bad at explaining it. Um, and what we need are really good narratives around issues of complexity, um, science, technology, and society. It is a truism, but nonetheless true, that the problems that face us today um, are really complex, are wicked, are very difficult to know ca what cause and effect chains exist, how you push on the problem in one way and get something uh, completely different that you didn't expect on the other, on the other end. And, and yet, um, the tools that we have for talking about uh, these problems, whether it's climate change or immigration or tax reform or the internet and privacy, uh, seem often very um, imp impoverished. And in desperation, I found myself increasingly turning to, to, uh, and, and it, to narrative as, as, um, as something that can capture complexity in ways that sort of standard expository discussion and argumentation don't be able to seem, seem to do very well. So that's what we want to explore today. And, and our three panelists are Vandana Singh, uh, Dave Rajeski, and Carl Schroeder. And I, I hate little capsule biographies read by people who don't know the people they're introducing. So instead, although I do know Dave, um, I'm going to ask the, the, the uh, panelists today to just for a minute or two talk about what they do and how, it, how they think about the connection between what they do and complex socio-technical problems. So why don't we just start with you, Vandana? All right. Well, my name is Vandana Singh. And uh, I am a science fiction writer, but I'm also uh, an associate professor at a small university, Framingham State University, uh, where, uh, among other things, I research climate change science pedagogies. And uh, I'm very, very interested in climate change uh, as a science and also as a wicked problem. And uh, I write about it. I uh, stay up uh, nights thinking about it. And so that's my, my big thing. Hi, I'm Dave Rajeski. I run the Science and Technology Innovation Program at the uh, Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. Um, so I get to play with all kinds of technologies. I do work on nanotech, synthetic biology, cognitive neuroscience, video games, citizen science. Um, so I get to the point where essentially I get to play with those things that are indistinguishable from magic, right. as Arthur Clarke said. But they're also, I think this is an important point, Ed Tenor at Princeton said that they're also the things that promote self-deception, precisely because they're so magical. And so <clears throat> these things are, all, these technologies are always skewing much more towards the benefits than the risks. They're skewing towards centralized control and not decentralized control. So they're, you're inherently in a very dangerous fulcrum when you're dealing with these technologies. Um, I don't believe there's actually a deficit of innovation. I think there's a deficit of futures, that our inability to think coherently about the future is the most dangerous thing that we're dealing with right now. And essentially, we're wasting the prefrontal cor cortex of our brains. I mean, we're essentially wired to do this, and we don't do it much. Um, and so <clears throat> we could talk a little bit more about, I've been involved with science fiction writers for 10 or 12 years for specific reasons we can discuss. but. Um, one of, the, one of the issues for me is how do you create very compelling narratives about the future? Uh, I'm Carl Schrader. I, I'm a science fiction writer and uh, 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 foresighter or futurist. We don't really have a good term for that. Um, for the last 15 years or so, I've been working for clients like the Canadian government and Army on um, uh, expressing and communicating complex ideas, uh, particularly about the future. Um, actually, I'd, uh, a book I'd recommend about that is uh, Dynamics in Action, whose author is escaping me right now. But uh, the, the, the thesis uh, of the book is that um, uh, complex dynamical systems, which uh, well can only really be understood in terms of the context and history. When you write context and history, that's something we call a narrative. It's called a story. So the, be the best way to actually analyze certain kinds of real world problems uh, literally is narrative. Uh, I did my master's uh, thesis on um, uh, translating foresight findings into fiction as a way of communicating them in a concise sort of zipped package. Um, and I continue to work on uh, that kind of uh, uh, exploration. Okay. Great, thanks. So, sorry? 
Alicia, yeah, or Herrero, yeah. So, so um, I, I'd, I'm, I'm hoping to put your actual stories at the center of our conversation, and I'll get to them in a minute. But I wanted to, to start with um, uh, asking Dave, who's the, the policy wonk and the ad man, odd man out in the, in the group, to talk a little bit about, um, to expand on your point about the, the value of fiction in, the, um, in, in addressing policy problems. Because as you say, when we're talking about these emerging technologies, um, and, and how they are always expressed in terms of the wonderful things they do, um, usually with a deficit of imagination of possibilities. Um, and then it's turned over to people like me uh, to, to figure out how to think about the policy frameworks around those. Um, and obviously, you found that to be unsatisfactory and have, and have therefore pulled in right. people like Vandana and, and Carl to, to help you. So can you talk a little bit about why you've done that and how it works? Sure. I mean, I, I'll start with a, a, a depressing story. In 2000, yeah, 2000, I went around and I interviewed all the major heads of the policy and planning offices in the government. Of course, we're free to talk now because they just left government. <laughs> Health and Human Services, the State Department that had a premier policy and planning unit. Um, basically, I went through every agency. And they all basically, I asked them, how far ahead do you think? And they said, not very far. I said, what did you think you were going to do before you got into this job? I thought I was going to think about the future. And none of them did. Right? And so I started to go agency by agency and said, who thinks about the future? I don't, I'm not talking about the thing that you submit to OMB, your plan your strategic plan that goes out four or five years and you use essentially to maximize your budget for next year. Who actually thinks about the future? And I, I ended up in NASA um, and a guy, I talked to a guy and he said, let me show you our 200 year plan. <laughs> okay. <That's great. laughs> okay, so you got, got my attention. And um, at that point in time, the NASA was run by Dan Golden. Uh, and Dan's senior advisor was a guy named uh, Yojo Kandi or Kondo, I think. Uh, some of you sci-fi writers know him as Eric Katani. So here's a guy that was running NASA whose primary advisor was an astrophysicist and a sci-fi writer. And so we actually worked with NASA to start, uh, we had a meeting where we actually brought in all kinds of science fiction writers with people from all over the government. Uh, Arthur Clarke dropped in via satellite. Uh, we had Charles Sheffield, who's unfortunately passed away. We said, I sent a TV crew out uh, to do interviews with Greg Bear, Elizabeth Moon, Joe Haldeman. So uh, incredible numbers of sci-fi writers. Um, just to think long term with the government agencies. And it was an incredible exercise. But I couldn't sustain it. So I, the thing that I started to think about is how actually would you create an interface that would allow this to happen on a constant basis, which I think is part of what you guys are doing here. Because I think it really is important. Because I think the the narrative is important, though the other thing I like, I want it from the narratives, I want a narrative where I can touch the button. And that's one of the things that got me into video games. So I want to be able to push on A and see that B doesn't happen. Hmm. So not only do I want a story, right? I want a story with an algorithm behind it <laughs> that would allow me to say, okay, I want, I'm not going to understand complexity until I can play with it. And so I would love to be able to figure out my ideal world is, can I, can I actually engage the people that really can write great narratives and put those together with the models and sort of the, the complexity behind these systems, whether it's climate change or you know, <clears throat> intervening in pandemics, whatever it is. But I do believe that, uh, and something that, that George Lakoff said, he's a cognitive linguist, that framing precedes policy. So one thing we can get to later is the question of who gets to write the algorithms and why we should trust them. Yeah. So, so you guys, in some sense, are writing the algorithms. So l let me um, take the liberty of quickly describing your two stories, and then, then maybe we can discuss them. But, uh, but again, I want to focus on this theme of, of how you think about bringing a really complex, indeterminate, open system type problem into the discipline of a narrative in a way that respects the complexity of the problem. So, so Carl's two wonderful stories, if you haven't read them, please um, go, go do so right afterwards. Carl's story is called Degrees of Freedom. Um, I've never done this before. It's make, it makes me nervous. So if I screw up, you'll just correct me, right? So, um, but it's no, a story we'll of silently judge you. Yeah, please. <laughs> so, okay, you're right. um, so it's a story about how indigenous people in Western Canada using some fascinating speculative decision support technologies work to undermine the 
power and influence of the centralized national government. Um, and, and the narrative plays out through, uh, through the con conflicting roles and worldviews of, of a father and son, which provides a lot of the narrative tension. Um, but complexity itself provides some of the narrative tension, the wickedness of the problems of equality and, and environment that Carl's concerned with. It's an explicit theme in the story, and, and th these hybrid decisions support social media technologies. They're, they're portrayed as crucial for helping to manage the complexity. And in that way, there's a strong connection to Vandana's story, which is called Entanglement. And it's a succession of brief, thematically related uh, narratives about individuals in most cases, I'd say, kind of sad, lonely individuals uh, working in different ways in different parts of the world to try to address uh, climate change. And, and through the story, we see a kind of growing, almost mysterious evidence that the separate narratives, as separate narratives usually do, uh, have more explicit connection to um, that we only learn about, of course, near the end. Um, as with degrees of freedom, um, we learn again about an intriguing, speculative social networking technology, which in this case provides this kind of almost mysterious connection among the, the, the characters. So here the complexity is, is portrayed differently. It's through the rich diversity of places um, and, and the environmental difficulties, the personal challenges behind each narrative. So where I want to start off with is what seems to me to be um, kind of an interesting uh, tension here, especially regarding our previous panel, mm -hmm. which is that um, you both find <laughs> great hope in the capacity of, uh, of, I guess this is your positive hieroglyph, the capacity of these um, uh, complex c cognitive social uh, decision support technologies and actually bringing people together and bringing societies together to sh have shared understandings that enable maybe better collective action. And so, um, uh, that how talk talk a little bit about your technology, your view of technology, in, especially perhaps in light of the complexities that we've already been discussing uh, today. Well, um, uh, a few years back, I noticed something about science fiction, um, and by extension, the community that reads science fiction, and, and that is that we're perfectly happy to speculate about wild, amazing advances in biology, in, in, in nanotechnology, in artificial intelligence, in materials, in space travel. The one thing we will not imagine is that we could improve the way we make decisions. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a gigantic blind spot, uh, and I wanted to ex uh, explore that and look at that. And when I did, I discovered that, in fact, we have already got uh, amazing uh, tools, technologies, and methodologies that do this, that in, in improve the way we uh, make decisions both collectively and in groups. But people don't know about it because they assume in advance that it can't be done. Um, so all of the, 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 this story does is trot some of those out. None of these are my ideas. Um, uh, you know, things like uh, um, uh, structured dialogic design, it's been around for, for ages. It was used in Cyprus. It's a governmental tool used by um, uh, s some of the, the, the First Nations bands in the US as their governmental you know, modus operandi. Um, I'm just putting out things that already exist. Um, and I'm a little bit shocked that this is seen as innovative. <laughs> <laughs> Shock. <laughs> well, um, uh, in my story, um, I envision technology in a certain context. And in complex systems, I think context is just as important as the thing you're looking at. Uh, so if I may, uh, and I know that many people in this room already know this, some better than I do, uh, let me attempt to define what I mean by complexity. And then I'll weave in what, uh, how I saw technology as part of it in my story. Uh, so a complex system is one with many interacting parts where the interactions are strong, the interactions are nonlinear typically, so that the behavior of the system as a whole cannot be easily, cannot in fact be, uh, be uh, obtained or be even studied to some extent without uh, an understanding of the interactions. So it's another way of saying that the sum is greater than its parts. Um, and such systems have interesting features like feedback loops, tipping points. Sometimes complex systems are chaotic. So, um, so the way I see it, and I come from an aggressively democratic uh, nation, uh, and where uh, you know, being 
having arguments is a good thing. In fact, there's even a book called The Argumentative Indian. So, uh, so the way, the way I, I saw it is, all right, what's the context and what are the struggles that are playing out? And uh, instead of having technology being developed in a top-down way, uh, because technology has impact on people and on society and on lives, and it changes things, and sometimes not always in, it's not always in the interests of the people who use it, as we've been hearing um, during, through the course of the day. So, so what I wanted to do was invert that and violate the third forbidden H, as Neil talked about, and talked about, and I wanted to see how is it that, uh, you know, what could happen if people developed a technology to serve a need uh, through a, some kind of a, a community experience, uh, instead of it being invented for you by Apple, for instance. Um, and, and this need in this case is global climate, climate change, climate disruption. And uh, so the way I was looking at it was that uh, this is a wicked problem. I, uh, the way I conceptualize a wicked problem is one that arises in a complex system. And, uh, and we have interlocking complex systems here. Uh, we have the climate system, which is complex. Uh, we have uh, societies, which are uh, parts of the whole equation, which are complex. We have, uh, we've been told we live in the Anthropocene, but some scholars are challenging that and saying, we live in the Capitalocene. Mm -hmm. So, and, and essentially saying that um, climate change is the logical end result of mm -hmm. runaway capitalism. <coughs> So uh, it's not so much a species thing, uh, as Anthropocene suggests, as a particular kind of uh, paradigm. And, uh, and uh, so, so what I wanted to look at was, what if you looked at technology as arising from people who are concerned about things? And when you look at global problems, when you look at wicked problems, you have to uh, shed certain, or perhaps dilute or put away certain aspects of your identity and put on other cloaks in a way. Uh, so for instance, it's less important whether you are American or you know, from uh, Serbia or from India when you're looking at a global problem because nature doesn't give a damn about political boundaries. And so in a sense, in those situations, for those contexts, it makes sense to put on a kind of global citizen's hat. And we don't know how to do that. Uh, we have you know, things like the internet, we have Facebook, and so on and so forth, but uh, they haven't gone as far as I would like to see science fictionally in creating a global environmental consciousness. So in my story, among, there are two things, two ways that technology comes in. One is uh, through a massive citizen science project on the Arctic Ocean, uh, which is ground zero for climate change because uh, temperatures are rising there twice as fast as the globe on an average. Uh, and uh, so there's a massive citizen uh, science surveillance project that involves incidentally hacked drones, among other things. Um, and then the other way that technology comes in is through a, a kind of internet-based device that connects people from different countries and different uh, backgrounds through what I imagine is the community of strangers people you don't know connecting to you in needed moments for to make a difference. So sorry I went on a little long, but I wanted to put it in the right context. So uh, I want to pursue this notion of, of ag aggressive democracy, which I think is really, really interesting. And um, Carl, even if I shouldn't be surprised, I thought the, 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 um, the description of the uh, process and technology of getting people in a room to make sure that they each understand one another's perspectives so that they can actually have a conversation where when they're nodding they really understand what the person on the other side of the table is saying, um, seemed to, to uh, address one aspect of a problem that uh, I haven't heard discussed yet today, but which I think underlies so much of this, which is diversity of values and, and value conflict. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm curious, as uh, it seemed to me that your stories took a different perspective. You, you, um, so Vandana, you're pretty clear about where you stand um, and make that, the, the narrative serve your value perspective. Whereas Carl, it seemed to me you're willing to be more agnostic and, um, and say something about the importance of values um, uh, emerging from democratic discourse that's truly democratic. So I wonder if you could, you could each talk um, 
about how you see your own uh, values via -vis these complex situations that you're trying to elucidate and the role of the story in, um, in addressing value dispute. And then, uh, then that'll lead to my question to Dave. So you'll just have to be in suspense. <laughs> um, well, uh, by deliberately choosing the Haida uh, as the context, I was choosing um, uh, uh, I am not Haida. Um, and uh, therefore, I, I deliberately took off the table the possibility that I could be representing this group. Um, in order to focus on what was on the table, which was the method or methodologies involved. So the story is not about um, the advocacy of a particular group. Uh, it's about advocacy of certain methodologies. Um, and what, there, for instance, in the story, there's a, uh, a website called wegetit.com. Um, I, I wanted it to be iagree.com, but I think that's already taken. Um, but uh, it's, it's a website where there are discussion forums, but the only action that you can take is to agree. You can either agree or drop out of the discussion. Um, and this is in del deliberate um, contrast to the, the way the internet forum structure is set up right now, <laughs> which is to f apparently to foster disagreement. You know, if you, if you look at the, the, the way the internet acts, it often acts as a saint, but if you look at the way the internet talks, it talks like a psychopath. Um, it's, uh, you know, discussion forums are fundamentally broken in that they are disagreement generators. Uh, so one of the, th the things I wondered is, okay, could we just tweak that? Uh, and the story as a whole is, uh, is uh, one of the things I say is that th there will be no Facebook for politics because politics is too <laughs> wicked and complex a problem um, and too multifaceted. But you can improve small things. Uh, and in the story, hundreds of small things are improved simultaneously, which gives the effect of uh, you know, uh, Im improving politics. But um, uh, one of the things you can improve is just uh, the way that people agree about the, the fundamental meaning of words when they're discussing things on the internet. Structured dialogic design, which is something I allude to, um, uh, developed by Aleko Christakis and, and others, um, is a workshop tool that does this. Um, one of the things I wondered was, could you take that workshop tool, which works uh, efficiently for up to about 60 people in a room, and magnify it so that it'll work for a million? Um, and if you only solve one little problem like that, you can have a magnified effect um, on uh, people's ability to get along. Uh, and that was really all that I was trying to say. Well, that's saying a lot, given the current politics <laughs> around these wicked problems. So mm -hmm. yeah, uh, so Bonnie, can you address the uh, question? The yeah, yeah. Uh, that, uh, but I would like to distinguish between values and models, uh, because, you know, well, even in, uh, and I would also, uh, like to say that you probably shouldn't judge my values by my stories necessarily, uh, because uh, part of the, f the wonderful fascination of writing and writing fiction, writing science fiction, is that really anything, is, uh, anything can be set up to be interrogated, including one's most dearly held assumptions about the world. And uh, one thing that I've learned by being a scientist, my background's in theoretical particle physics, uh, is that uh, there are, you know, ideologies are like models. They have limited usefulness. They have domains of validity. Mm. They are not uh, a deity, you know. So, uh, so, you know, I feel free to critique uh, anything from capitalism to communism to whatever. In fact, I think we need new isms because we are in a new age where we are recognizing the complexity and interconnectedness of the world. And so the old Newtonian paradigm of the clockwork universe is one of the things I was playing with in my story that, um, uh, and in fact, any good fiction um, is, is really an attempt to look at uh, a situation in the real world. So for instance, I could write a dry treatise about the psychology and the geopolitics of, uh, of a certain area in India 
and about a family feud involving inheritance and property and so on and so forth. And I could do that as a soci uh, sociology project or an anthropology project, but then I could also write the Mahabharata, which is a great epic. And so that's what fiction does. It, uh, because we cannot, because human beings and human systems are not uh, simple systems, we are multivariable systems with you know, very, um, very nonlinear interactions, uh, that's why we have literature. That's why we have arts because they, uh, they, they are basically, they somehow condense the complexity of the problem into that one experience. And so, so when I look at, when I look at uh, values, uh, you know, uh, and I propose them as a thought experiment, or I, uh, it's more like I'm looking at a model of a, or a paradigm of a, the way of looking at the world, and really anything is up to be kind of challenged and interrogated. And uh, now that the Newtonian clockwork universe, uh, which, which we know does not exist, uh, is, is being questioned. And, uh, and now that we are recognizing uh, that you know, the way we live, everything that we do, including how we recreate, how we, how we enjoy ourselves, um, there's a history behind it. Uh, look, at industrial, uh, the, look at the Industrial Revolution. Uh, nuclear families did not really exist before the Industrial Revolution. So the Newtonian paradigm of the clockwork universe informs every aspect of our lives. And the great pity is that the universe is, in fact, not Newtonian. So um, what I like to imagine in my stories is uh, what if we had societies or interactions between people or technologies that were based on a non-Newtonian, more realistic paradigm of the universe. And one of the things we learn again and again in different contexts in the universe, you know, if you're doing quantum physics or, or, or you know, in complex systems theory, is connection. Things are connected. And so, so that's, that, was the, that was the main thing pushing me. Of course, one of the story. similarities between ideologies and models is once someone falls in love with one, they tend to stick with it for the rest of their lives, right? right? So, right. Um, Newton's hard to kill off, isn't he? So, so, so Dave, you're, you're in the belly of the beast, and, and these guys get to write their stories, but, but you're trying to actually influence policy and the narratives around policy. And a cliche is, of course, that one good anecdote is you know, worth a thousand data points in Congress. But nonetheless, it seems like we haven't yet gotten very good at using narrative to influence the way we um, talk about these, these complex uh, socio-technical problems. So can you talk a little bit about your experiences and ha where, where, where you think we need to go um, if, if, if we're going to actually have narrative do work for us in places like Washington, D.C.? So I'll give, you, I mean, I'll give you an example that kind of builds off of the things that you were talking about in your story. Um, about five years ago, I had this idea. Is one of the things that gets battled with in, in Washington is the budget. Right? There is no policy. There's just a budget. Right? <laughs> the illusion that we have poli the budget drives everything. So I had this idea, OK, what if I can get a million people to play with a budget? Mm -hmm. right? So we, we, we actually built a game. Um, and it's built on a lot of the macroeconomic models that are used by the Congressional Budget Office, right, <laughs> and form the Congress. Um, and we put it out there. And the thing that was quite amazing is now there's over 2 million people that played it. Uh, and you enter the game through a narrative. We ask you to take a value stand. I really want to do inter energy independence. I believe in a better social safety net, whatever it is. And now you build the budget, right? Go, right? <laughs> and you've got access to. 80, 100 policies, right? Uh, and of course, it's a big data machine. We had a huge arguments about, OK, how do we protect the people that are putting data in? Do we let them share data about their demographics, right? Because there's a certain amount of value we get out of the back end. Um, anyway, the short story is this, this it goes viral. It gets, it's in thousands of schools across America. It's, you know, all of a sudden, people are playing with a relatively complicated system that nobody thought they could ever understand, right? We get 40,000 emails from people, right? Saying, you know, this is, this is the first time I ever understood what the alternative minimum tax was, right? So people get to play with all these things that they always wanted to do. Let's get rid of foreign aid. Right? Mm -hmm. Assumptions, right? Just test your assumptions. I, I don't like the EPA. Cut the EPA's budget in half. Of course, nothing happens in the big picture. But they get to play it. They can crash this. It's a flight simulator. Um, <laughs> and we're collecting all the data in the back end. Now, the wonderful thing that happens, right, 
is that if you collect a million data points, you actually begin to see that people start to act almost against their own self-interest. So one of the things we found was older people were willing to raise the Social Security age threshold. The wealthier people were willing to pay more for prescription drugs. Right? So all of a sudden, when they were put in a situation where they had to make really severe trade-offs, right? I just have, how did they get put in those situations? Was, in, was this driven by narrative that then? Well, narrative and numbers. I mean, yeah, they had to make choices. Um, so, you know, I think one of the things we're working now on a global, a, a global di a dynamic simulation where you play with the entire global energy system. Uh, you get to con control what you, how you produce energy. Set carbon tax. What would you do? What if you had millions of people playing this? We have another work game on working on on the Arctic. Actually, mm -hmm. what happens mm -hmm. when the ice melts, right? And all of a sudden, mineral rights opened up and fish rights, right? How are we going to sort of essentially? And that that's a soft sort of soft governance system up there. So I think the thing that that's interesting to me is about these stories is that we have the capacity technologically to give these complex systems to millions of people, but we it's, can't give them to the appropriation subcommittee chairs. No. And that's what we have to do. Well, we have to do that. But I think the interesting thing was that it allowed us, as the data came back, we worked with American public media and a bunch of, it allowed us to create an alternative narrative, right? That mm -hmm. was different from the talking heads in Washington, right? So we actually had journalists going out and interviewing. And also diff different from all the interest groups right. that, are, that right. don't engage in these negotiations. They're in their own silos. Right. And so and the, the, the interesting thing was this alternative narrative actually emerged from people that were playing the game. Um, the other surprising thing that this is kind of, it's not so startling, but it's scary. I'll tell you, I went to a party. I met somebody from the Congressional Budget Office. I told them, we, you know, we developed this game. And they said, we play it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, why do you guys play it? I mean, it's based on your, your models. He said, but we never see the whole picture. Yeah. Mm. Right? Well, selfishly, I could continue <laughs> to, to probe, but I think we should see if, mm. if uh, the people have questions. So let's start and move back. What's, what's that game called? A uh, budget hero. Uh, uh, thank you. Hero. Um, uh, probably you heard in Europe we launched in 2000 a big program, knowledge, economy, and society, the most vibrant one in the world. And today we don't talk about it anymore. We come to America to learn something. Uh, my question is the following. I'll give you a real story this summer in Switzerland. Uh, you know about autism, it will be a march uh, this coming uh, Sunday. And until a recent study, everybody thought that autism is due for 80% to genetics. And it engaged a lot of resources. And now, a uh, latest study confirmed is less than 50%. Or this is almost a paradigm shift according to the experts. Now, we have so many information which mobilize resources, uh, financial resources, political resources, like the case of uh, autism. And we don't know how to handle it. How would you address this issue? We try to, to think of it like conduct more experiments, get people more involved, and so on. But how could we correct? Because we multiply those mistakes now. Autism is a huge social cost, human cost, at least in Switzerland, where I, I have my grandson. So uh, how would you address this issue? Uh, we heard very much many other cases, but everything related to human condition is costly. How do we handle this? So is the, is the, is the bigger question here um, how to use narrative to, to basically change the framings around, uh, around complex issues that are rooted in, in bad ideas? Is that the basic idea? Um, yeah, the, uh, th there are, again, ways of, of I'm, I'm blanking on a particular uh, morphological analysis, for instance. You can use that to explore um, a very complex solution spaces for complex problems. And, and I'm sure that Europe does that. Um, but uh, uh, you can. With tools like uh, the uh, uh, Budget Hero, and in my story I have Sim Canada, um, you, uh, you can let people literally play through the possibilities. You don't assume that the current studies on autism are correct, but you have to do a risk analysis uh, and say, right now, right here, uh, on, on the basis of what we know, we have to make an investment. 
you know, it might turn out later that you were wrong and that the science was wrong. Um, but you have no other option than to do that. S sometimes it, it will just, you will, will have gone down uh, a blind alley. But if you um, went down that blind alley, you know, using all the correct steps, basically, uh, you're blameless in doing that. Uh, just sometimes uh, the real world cannot be anticipated. Um, but there is a space, of course, for evidence-based policy, and that's a, a different conversation. Um, but uh, that's the, my other hobby horse right now, is getting away from ideology to evidence-based. Um, and, and, and uh, um, yeah, uh, and I won't, I won't fall down that rabbit hole right now, but it's a big one. Um, when, you, when you were doing your introduction, you mentioned synthetic biology and nanotechnology, and you put them in the context of, of uh, technologies, futures that uh, magic that um, lends more to centralization than decentralization. But those are very active hack hacker spaces, both of them. And in your in your story, in particular, I. I get the feeling that there was a hacking of government going on. I mean, I'm, I'm not faulting the tools, but this was a serious attempt to hack the governmental body. Yeah. And, and I'm curious, how do you provide a solution when people are out there making their own solutions at the same time? There is no central solution to a lot of these problems because they have many solutions that are being attacked simultaneously by small groups, mm. or sometimes not so small groups. Um, I'm not necessarily an advocate of um, the situation that I'm describing in the story, first of all, uh, uh, because what I'm describing is government becoming more of a marketplace um, uh, where there are literally alternative governments that you can choose to, to uh, ally yourself with. Um, and I, I am a believer uh, in the necessity of, of, you know, of uh, an ongoing state apparatus. But what I was saying basically was that there's going to be a, there, a, a negotiation and a conversation is going to be forced upon government by technology and technologists. Uh, and they're going to have to be ready for it. And I think uh, one of the, one of, we work with um, biohackers. Uh, these are people that are, they have more and more capacity. In fact, I've got a, I have the capacity in my office now to swab DNA and, and amplify it and analyze it um, for $700. So um, one of the issues is um, how do you actually allow these people to innovate? Because there could be a lot of innovate, but how do you allow them to do, do that in a safe way, in a responsible way? So one of the programs we came up with is called, um, it's called Ask a Biosafety Officer. And basically we went to the universities where they have biosafety officers and we said, well, would you be willing to volunteer your time to help these folks. And we set up an anonymized website uh, so that the DIY bio folks can actually pose a question. Um, and <clears throat> that's sort of rooted to the, the various universities, to the professionals. And so it's an attempt to kind of take this world of, of government, which is hierarchically controlled. We know the rules of being other regs, uh, closed IP. And how do you interface that with a world that's network-based, where we're, there's open sharing, there's a gift economy. And, you know, it's a completely different world. Um, so that just the, the questions just come in, and they're ferreted out, and the questions come back, and there's sort of uh, a whole archive of, of answers. Um, and it's the problem we had was we tried for eight months to get this launched, and nobody would insure it. Right? So it was an interesting question about how do you operate in the space, right? Mm -hmm. So we ended up having to go to Lloyd's of London. Right? Lloyd's of London to get to, and they had to figure out how would I insure these people in the university, because the university was not going to insure these folks if they're talking to garage biologists. <laughs> right? And so we cost us five grand a, a year to insure the, the people in the universities. But that was, a, a, that was kind of a wicked problem because it wasn't obvious how we were actually going to get these, this whole system to work because it was built outside of the system, right? I'm glad Lloyd's exists for that reason. <laughs> Yes, uh, this, this question is for Dave. Uh, since you uh, uh, raised the issue of future studies, uh, since science and technology are dominant forces in society um, and research and innovation are inherently future-oriented, yet 
how many PhD programs do we have in future studies? Mm -hmm. um, I posit that very few, because when I got interested in future studies, I couldn't find uh, just one graduate school in University of Houston led by Peter Bishop and Andy Hines, and a PhD program in the University of Hawaii, and one in Australia led by Richard Slaughter, but... One in what, Canada now, in Toronto. That, why don't we have PhD program in future studies? Because of the National Academy of Sciences and, 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 and similar organizations that create, a, including the universities themselves, that create a standard for what counts. And I don't know what kind of fight they had in Toronto uh, it's a design program Yeah, uh, in a design school. That was how it happened. But I, yeah, I can tell you that we're, we're uh, um, fighting similar battles at a, at a university that is very open to innovation. The problem is really among the faculty. It's not the administration. Hard time getting a, a putting a committee together because I want to pursue future study as a line of inquiry, and they don't want to touch it. Right. Yeah. No. This is a this is a significant obstacle to to taking this discussion to the next step in terms of how do you mainstream it in what we consider to be legitimate, valid ways of intellectual expression in the academy of expressing yeah. ourselves intellectually in the academy. The uh, in 19, I can if you want this, I can get it for you. In 1977, the National Found Science Foundation, uh, NSF, had a program called RAN, Research Applied to National Needs, right? And the RAN program actually did a large report on trying to think about how you would create a future studies method, a, a, a discipline, right? Because that was the issue. It sort of it never had any scientific legitimacy, mm -hmm. um, and so that there was an attempt in the '70s to actually create a, a for NSF to see whether they could raise this up to the point where it became recognized as a discipline, which gets you over some of the resistance in universities, but not completely. And tell everyone what happened to RAM. It's gone. Well, no, it's. I think it's still on the in the book. It's not in the law. Uh, part it part of the, the problem law, it might be in the law, yeah. but it, yeah. yeah, part of the problem with that era was. Um, <clears throat> that we all thought that um, future studies should be about prediction, right? Um, and uh, that was kind of the killer. Uh, now what you have is schools and, and practitioners who are focusing on the issue of uncertainty itself. Um, and uh, so uh, rather than the futurist, I've been thinking of calling myself an ambiguist. <laughs> well, and, <laughs> and, and this gets to Vandana's point about the difficulty of getting past the idea of a Newtonian Cartesian world. You know, it, it is not about uh, the deterministic path to a future. It is about exploring the spaces. And thank goodness we have wonderful narrative writers to help us do it, which would be a great last thing to say, I suppose. Um, do we have any time left? Two minutes. So, do you, you have a quick question? Very quick question. Um, the mention of Lloyd's of London. Uh, triggered uh, something in me, um, a memory, and that is back in the 1980s, Lloyds of London was doing the only long-term research into climate change because of the insurance risk. So I wondered what other unusual organizations uh, have you come across that is doing similar long-term planning, long-term strategy, if our government agencies were having such difficulty with it a few years ago? Um, the, the insurance folks are great, and especially the reinsurance re folks, uh, because they usually pick up the dregs that nobody will insure. So w when Nanotech started out, I mean, it was, it was Swiss reinsurance, Munich reinsurance, Allianz, Lloyds, um, because they couldn't monetize the risks, right? And that makes them very, very uncomfortable. So, and they obviously climate change. So I've done a lot of work with, there's an emerging risk unit at Lloyds, and that's their only job. And their job is to inform the entire insurance industry. Uh, but there's not a lot of, I mean, one of the things when I was, I spent six years in the White House, I had this vision that I would walk down the hall and there would be an office, there would be a plaque on the wall that said, the U.S. Department of Unintended Consequences. <laughs> <laughs> we fail so you don't have to. <laughs> How many people would it take just to think, I'm talking about the government, our government as a whole, can, could we afford a, a dozen people mm. just to think through the unintended consequences potentially of our policies? No, you know, we can't do that. So, the that huh? The Office of Net Assessment, Andy Marshall. 
Yeah, the Andes, yeah. But that's a rare, yeah. So, so I wanna indulge myself with one last question of the authors, which is, is I, I had a, um, a sense that, uh, that perhaps in both stories of a bit of regret and, and th that the world is so complex. Um, and I was particularly taken by the fact that you both um, had central characters who were indigenous. Um, and that obviously symbolizes all sorts of things in a, in a non-indigenous reader about you know, simplicity and harmony. And so I'm, I'm curious about whether or not you, you have each fully embraced, spiritually embraced the notion of complexity and indeterminacy, or if there's really a romantic core in your ambition that wishes we could get back to a simpler world. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, I, I really, you know, as I say, I, I like being ambiguous. I, I, I like the complexity of all this stuff. And uh, complexity d does not mean uh, chaos necessarily. I mean, the, the human brain and the human body are in, in incredibly complex, um, but they work. Uh, uh, so, I, I, I mean, lately I've been exploring cybernetics, which is uh, something that people don't study anymore but it's all about homeostasis in complex systems. And homeostasis, and again, a word that just doesn't get used anymore or studied, is a very important concept for us right now. Um, and uh, uh, it's quite compatible with complexity. Fonda, would you like the last word here? Similarly, um, I think uh, I actually rejoice in complexity uh, because it's in complexity, I think, that we have, or in complex systems are also systems of great hope and uh, I'm going to end with uh, what a student of mine once told me. Uh, this was when I was first learning how to teach climate change. And when I started to do it reasonably well, I realized that all my students would get depressed. Uh, but then I added a study of complexity uh, to, uh, my, uh, to my story about climate and uh, uh, to explain the, some of the whys and wherefores. And uh, I remember one student looking unusually chipper after a series of lectures, and I asked her why, and uh, she said that she thinks she has hope because uh, after all, she said, well, the global climate system is complex, but so are human societies, as I'd been saying. But what she had realized was that just as uh, you know, com complex systems have tipping points, so do sociological systems. And so that she realized that although she was just one little cog in a machine, that you know, if you have the right parameters and if even a small shift in the right parameters can change human behavior, then well, why not be hopeful? Because she still had a role that she could usefully play in making the future that is to come. So I just want to end with that story. <laughs> Thank you. We'll end with that.